Why VFDs? Can anybody tell me why we're looking to use VFDs? The main reason basically is energy savings. Why? If we're using an example for a standard application where we are controlling a flow, by example, okay? The classic one will be with what? So we have a motor that is powering a pump, the pump is pushing the flow, okay? How are we controlling the flow in that case, in a classic way, without a VFD? Dampers. With dampers, inlets, all kind of uh, mechanical gear. gear, okay? Is that efficient? not for the motor. Why? Because the motor is going to work always at the full speed and it's going to take the full amount of uh, power required, okay? Now, if we're using a an VFD instead of that, we can actually control the flow by controlling the speed of the motor. So we don't have to run the motor at full speed all the time. So it's all about saving dollars, okay? Now, when we're uh, uh, trying to look at VFDs, we have to look at multiple things, okay? So what we uh, came up, we came up with an acronym, you know, that is uh, illustrating a little bit what we have to look at when we're trying to uh, pick up a VFD for a certain application, okay? And we're calling that a backpack. It's easy to remember. B, basic AC motor and drive theory design. So this will be your, and think about this, uh, Backpack is exactly like when you're packing an actual backpack. You will have to put everything in there so it's as balanced as possible, okay? So you're starting from the base of the backpack where you're putting whatever it's more heavier, you know, the basic stuff, and you're going up and adding all kind of other uh, uh, things like accessories and so on, and you will see. So in this case, for our base, it's gonna be this basic AC uh, motor and drive theory, okay? A, application evaluation to determine drive size and performance. C, for control scheme, scheme for analog, digital, IOs and um, uh, communication and so on. P is uh, for protection, uh, process motor drive and line. A, ambient environment, pollutants, temperature, moisture. And C, it's going to be commissioning and integration. Okay, and we're going to touch on each of these ones today. Now, for the basics, everybody knows how the electric motor is built, okay? So we have our motor frame, some wiring covers, stator, rotor, and belts, okay? It's pretty standard. Now, how the motor is uh, working, basically, when we're passing the uh, three phase uh, through, um, uh, through the windings, basically, we will uh, have a, a magnetic field that basically will push the rotor so it's going to rotate uh, and will create that uh, motion. Okay, three phase applied to the stator winding, rotating magnetic field is created. Okay. The speed of the rotating field, it's gonna be called your synchronous speed, okay? And we have a, a formula to calculate that. It's pretty straightforward. It's 120 multiplied by your frequency and divided by the number of poles. Now, the frequency here in North America, we're using 60 Hertz, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Number of poles, what can we have for poles for a motor? This number of poles. So, the speed, in this case, is going to be influenced mostly by the number of poles that we have, okay? Higher number of poles, how it's going to be the speed? Higher or lower? Okay? More poles, less speed, okay? Now, if we're changing the frequency, we can also change the speed. Because in the formula, if we're looking, it's 120 multiplied by frequency and poles. Now, the motor is already built. We have two poles, four poles, or six poles, so we cannot play with that anymore. So what we can play with is the frequency in this case. Okay, 10 hertz is gonna be slow, 30 is gonna be faster, 60 is gonna be the synchronous speed, okay? Now for uh, the same uh, formula, two poles, four poles, six poles, okay? We are going to touch this, but what do you think on a real motor? 
Is this what are we going to see on the nominal plate of the motor? Are we going to see 3600 RPM for a two pole motor? What do you think in a real life? Real motor. Less. Any idea why? We're going to touch a little bit on that, but. Okay, so we have the slip. Okay, so in uh, an ideal situation, your rotor will rotate at the same speed with the magnetic field created, okay? But we have some losses, okay? Who do you think is causing those losses? In the motor. Why it's not rotating at the same speed with the, with the rotor? What's that? Okay, you have some losses in the windage, right? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Bearings, so you have some frictions in there. So there are all kinds of things that uh, influence that. So we will never have that uh, speed. So all the time on your nominal plate, you will see something a little bit lower than the uh, um, uh, calculated uh, speed, okay? and. Who's going to calculate that? Basically the manufacturer of the motor. So they will measure that and depending on how well it, the motor build, you will see something close to that uh, number or something a little bit uh, uh, far from that number. Okay. The higher the load on the rotor shaft, the more the rotor will slip. Okay. So. Okay, we touch. So the actual speed will be your synchronous speed minus that slip. Okay. Now, um, let's introduce a little bit uh, the torque. So, measurement, of course, of uh, rotational uh, force. I don't think that I have to explain too much to the engineering side on that. You're uh, pretty familiar with this. Uh, it's the ability basically of that rotating element, you know, uh, uh, um, gear, shaft, or whatever you have to overcome that uh, turning resistance. And the uh, torque requirements uh, will be considered when you're selecting your drive. Uh, horsepower, unit of measurement. Okay, so these are just some basic formulas and we just put them there um, so you know what we are um, uh, talking about. Uh, in order to rotate that uh, motor shaft, basically, uh, under a specific load, uh, that motor will need to convert that electrical energy to a mechanical, mechanical energy, okay? And the uh, uh, horsepower rating of the motor will be actually the amount of the power that you need to provide the torque required by the, uh, by the application in order to uh, maintain your uh, motor's nominal uh, uh, motor's nameplate speed value at full load, okay? Uh, this is a little bit more developed, so if we're uh, replacing the wattage in the horsepower formula with uh, what the actual um, wattage means, uh, you get something a little bit more um, um, evolved. And uh, based on these formulas, you see what we can play in order with in order to um, adjust certain uh, um, elements like the speed of the motor. So if we're looking at this formula, what do you think we can touch in here in the influence mostly? Voltage and amperage basically, okay? The rest are pretty standard, okay? Okay, this is a, the torque speed curve for a standard NIMA B motor. Why NIMA B? Because NIMA B it's probably the most used motor on, uh, on uh, North America, okay? So, if we're looking at this, we have our locked rotor or stall torque. So this is where our motor is starting at zero speed, okay? So in order for us to start the motor, we have to break that, okay? Once we're starting, you have a pull up torque while the motor is uh, speeding toward the nominal speed. And you're getting in the pull-out or breakdown torque when the motor is getting close to what the nominal speed is, okay? And you will have your full load torque at pretty much the nominal speed. As you can see, it's not exactly 1800. Why? Because of your sleep. And remember, we already said that, okay? 
between here and here, you have your sleep, okay? And for us, really, that's what Doug was uh, saying earlier, this area where your sleep is, is the area where you, we can play. The higher the efficiency of the motor, the shorter interval we'll have for that sleep, so less room to play with, uh, with uh, uh, the VFD and the motor, okay? So this is pretty much the standard curve. Now, if we're looking, this is what I was saying, we have a couple NEMA designs for the motor. There is a NEMA E, which is not um, here, but this is mainly what you have, NEMA A, B, C, and D. You see all the difference between this. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, an application where you're demanding a lot of torque in the initial, when you want to start the motor, you know, like a big flying wheel or something like this, which motor do you think will handle better that situation without having a VFD? D. That's correct. Okay. But D, it's really expensive. It's, I think, about two or three times more expensive than an EMA B. Okay. So it's not very um, um, good solution in most of the applications. Now, with the VFDs, we don't really need this because the VFD can control differently how the, the motor is starting, so it's going to help with that. So that's another uh, good reason to use the VFD. Okay. Now, how did they build the uh, the algorithm and uh, um, theory behind the VFD drives? They took the motor and they, they translate that into an electrical circuit, okay? So if we're looking at our motor, it's gonna look pretty much like this in a uh, electrical diagram, okay? So you're gonna have your stator, you're gonna have your rotor, okay? You apply voltage at the motor terminals, you have a current flowing through uh, the uh, stator, you have the resistance in there, um, you have uh, uh, the magnetizing voltage, okay? So they looked at I'm not going to insist too much, but they looked at all the elements involved into this and they translated that into an equation that can be used in the algorithm control for the drive, okay? Um, for us, the ability to produce that torque, basically, it's going to be proportional with the wattage, okay? This is the formula, remember, for the wattage, volts multiplied by amps, uh, times 1.73 efficiency and power factor, okay? The, and the applied voltage will be determined, of course, by your source, okay? Uh, the amps, it's going to be applied by your total voltage and the total impedance of the uh, motor circuits. What, can, what do you think it's forming the impedance in a motor? Do we have capacitance in there? Okay. What kind of capacitance? Between different elements of the windings, basically, because you have an air gap, okay? So you have some capa capacitance. Um, resistance, of course, in your windings and stuff like that. So these are the elements, basically, that will, uh, will contribute to that. So the whole idea of this is just to know that in order to build that algorithm that is embedded in the drives, uh, we needed to look a little bit more deep into the theory of uh, the um, uh, electrical circuits, okay? And we translated basically the motor into that uh, uh, day, actually, not we, but. <laughs> Let's move on to our drive. So we have our motor. We basically, so what we have to, uh, to do with uh, our motors. Uh, now, the drive. Drives mainly are built from couple main elements, okay? You have your operator controls, which can be, I don't know, your keypad, uh, it can be an uh, uh, HMI through a communication or something like that. You have your control unit, you have your power conversion unit, and at the uh, output, of course, you have your uh, motor, okay? Most of the times with the drives, you have three phase in, three phase out, okay? Uh, is that all the time? Can you have one phase input? Yes, you can. Can you have one phase output? Actually, 
Yes, yeah. we can. <laughs> now we have the, the A1 drive, which DC. basically, uh, the DC1, sorry, which can do single line input, single line output, okay? So we can control actually some of the single line, uh, single phase motors that are out there, okay? With the previous drives and most of the drives that are available, we can do single phase at the input, but always three phase at the output. And most of the time when you have a three phase drive and you're using a single phase in, on the input of the drive, you'll have to derate that drive and sometimes you have to add uh, some extra capacitance, okay, on that. But now this is the important thing to know, we have a single phase to single phase uh, drive, okay. Now, if we're looking at, uh, a little bit farther into our drive, basically we will have our input line voltage, we have our rectifier, we have our DC bus, and we have our inverter at the output. So what we're doing basically, we'll, we are taking the three phase, okay, input, we have our sine wave, we transform that into DC, and at the output we have the inverter that will produce what is called a pulse with modulation. Why we're doing this? Why are we converting? Why are we not taking that AC and do something with it? We can't really change the frequency indeed on, uh, on that. So by converting that to DC and after that through the inverter into a, a peer pulse with modulation uh, uh, signal, we can uh, play with uh, frequency, you know, playing with the amplitude and stuff like that. If we're looking at our um, converter or, or rectifier section, and you will see, uh, you'll find in uh, literature this called both converter and rectifier. Truth be told, the output inverter basically, it's also a converter, okay? Because uh, if you're thinking converter design something, you're converting from AC to DC or from DC to AC, okay? So sometimes in uh, literature, you'll find the input rectifier called also a converter, okay? So it's nothing wrong with, uh, with that. Uh, rectifier basically is just, uh, most of the time it's a, a six diodes uh, a bridge, which will take your uh, AC and um, convert it to DC. Everybody knows how a diode uh, is working, so it's either allowing or not allowing the current to pass through. Okay, so depending on where your um, um, input phase will be, uh, it will let or not uh, the current to pass and that's going to create your uh, DC voltage. Uh, on some drives you'll see we can have uh, more than six um, uh, diodes on the uh, rectifier or uh, on some of the drives we can even have IGBTs that uh, commonly you find them on the uh, output but if you want to put back in the network when you are in a regen mode we are using IGBTs to let the current flow in the other direction too so basically it's becoming an inverter okay at that time okay Precharge circuit, this is standard with most of the drives. Why do we have a precharge circuit? On the DC bus we have capacitors, okay, which are here and we will touch a little bit later about them. Capacitors usually when you're starting the drive, they want to do what? To suck a lot of current, okay, they're very, very hungry. If you let that, you'll have a big in rush current, okay, which can damage your rectifier. So in order to temperate a little bit uh, what the, the capacitors are sucking in, you are using this precharge circuit, which basically it's a resistor connected uh, in series on uh, uh, one of the uh, branches of the DC bus, okay? Once the capacitors reach a certain uh, level uh, of charging, then we're closing the contact that is gonna bypass your resistor, okay? Usually with the drives, you will hear whenever you power the drive, you're powering up the drive, you will see a, you'll hear a click, okay? That click, it's actually that contactor that basically it's uh, closing and it's bypassing the resistor. And that's when you will basically get your ready signal for the drive, okay? Till that is not closed, the drive will not be able to operate, okay? <laughs> Very important. Um, some people I know, uh, electricians in the field out there, you know, they like to 
connect and disconnect the drive. If you're doing that too fast and too often, you're going to burn that resistor. Most of the time, the, that resistor is uh, basically directly on your PCB board, okay? It's not easy to replace, so sometimes you have to replace the entire board just because of that. Okay, we have our DC bus capacitors. They are basically there to uh, uh, provide a little bit of extra energy when it's needed, okay? So if your application is demanding uh, at a certain point a little bit more, you know, uh, in order to avoid any inrush and because the rectifier will not be able to provide that as fast as possible, you have those capacitors that will basically help a little bit. Um, in the inverter, the inverter basically is built with IGBTs. There are uh, again uh, six of them. Uh, the nice, things uh, nice thing with IGBTs is that you can basically control both when it's open and it's uh, closed you know, and you have a higher switching frequency uh, on uh, them. Okay. Also, on some of the drives, on some of the smaller frame sizes, we're offering this, by example, as a standard option. On some of them, it's uh, just an option. The motor can be a motor or can be a generator in some situation. When it's a generator, it's going to push all that energy that generates back onto our inverter. If we're not burning that energy, that's going to basically hit your DC bus. If you're hitting your DC bus a lot of time with uh, that, your IGBTs will not handle in time. So you want to burn off that energy. How? You have basically a 7 IGBT in this case that basically when it feels that you have some energy put back, it's going to burn that through a resistor. So it's going to just produce heat. On some of the drives, like I said, instead of having a braking, you can regen back into the grid by using SCRs or IGBTs on this side. Okay. This is how your uh, pulse width modulation uh, is looking and this is how we kind of try to recreate that uh, sine wave at the output of the drive. It's not an ideal sine wave because it's uh, pretty chopped and we can see in here. So we have different uh, durations for the inputs when we open or we're uh, closing the circuit. And based on that, you're creating something, you're trying to simulate basically that, uh, that uh, sine wave. Uh, higher the switching frequency, a little bit more nicer sine wave uh, you will have. But higher switching frequency, not very good for your motor because think about this, you, you're just opening and closing, opening and closing. So it's not that ideal perfect sine wave. So you basically just open, shoot, into your uh, uh, motor windings, close, open again. So the faster you're doing that, the worse it's for the motor and it's going to start to heat up, okay? And this is how your typical PWM uh, voltage and current waveforms are looking like. So you see it's not a very, very nice uh, sine wave, but it's working, okay? How efficient is your uh, VFD? They're pretty good actually these days, you know? And the amount of losses that you have on a VFD, basically, they're very small compared with the savings that you're doing in energy by using a VFD, okay? Why you have uh, some losses in the VFD? Because we have all kind of electronic involved, okay? We have some uh, resistance in there that is gonna just burn off some of the energy. Um, so there are some fixed losses, you know, which are a very, very small amount of the total power transfer. Usually we're about at 98.5% uh, like uh, efficiency, you know. That can vary, but that's pretty much. So it's really, really uh, low, okay. Um, the losses. Of course, you have your control logic, you have your cooling fan. This is one of the biggest uh, loss probably. But even for that, we have options. We can uh, have the fan to run only when the temperature reaches a certain value. And on bigger frame size drives, basically, we have fans that have their own little small VFD, okay? 
So they're not going all the time at the maximum speed, but they're also speed controlled, okay? Conduction losses, uh, proportional to your uh, current flow, and you have your switching losses into the IGBTs, okay?